All right. Hey, good morning, Campbellsville Baptist Church. Everybody good this morning. Isn't it a great chance to, to gather and come and worship King Jesus together? We're going to sing a song to start our worship. We've done it a few times. Lift high the name of Jesus. May that not just be words that fall off our lips in this room, but may we put it into practice. We're called as believers to tell of his goodness, to tell of the testimonies of his love and faithfulness, uh, all that he's done for us. So let's stand and sing and encourage one another to do that this morning. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus our King. Make known the power of His grace, the beauty of His peace. Remember how His mercy reached, and we cried out to Him. He lifted us to solid.
Good morning. And we're going to give a couple of announcements here before we have prayer for our veterans. Um, first, if you want to connect with us, you see all these shoe boxes all around the church here. Um, and you wonder, hey, how can I get involved? Well, in your bulletin, you can tear this little piece of paper out. You can fill it out, drop it in a, uh, an offering basket on your way out, or you can scan that QR code, and you can find out how to get involved in wonderful things like this that our church partakes in, okay, to where we get the gospel message out to the world. And then also, just a reminder tonight, business meeting, okay, at 6 o'clock. There are still some uh, budgets left over here as well, and we'll have to open that up for questions, um, you know, this evening. So you want to come out and be a part of that as well. But um, Veterans Day was just this past week, and until I'd done some research on it, I didn't realize that there are over 16 million veterans, both men and women, that have served our country. And, and then on top of that, a large majority of them are now 65 and older. You know, we see the hats where, where uh, the men and women wear the hats, you know, pretty much everywhere they go. Sometimes you can see by a license plate on the back of their car. You know, for me, it, it is a little personal. You know, I never served in the military. My grandfather, World War II. But we have cousins nephews, nieces, things like that, that are serving or had, have served over the years. And it's just, it brings things into light of the sacrifice that they and their families have made for us. They deserve our thanks. One of the things we have the privilege of doing, not only as a church, but as individuals is praying for them, praying for their families. If you served in the military or are active now, would you please stand? Thank you, you may be seated. Thank you. And, and you, you see those faces. Now you can put a name with that face. And if you don't know them this morning, you can walk up and introduce yourself and add their name to your prayer list. If you would, bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dearly Father, Lord, Lord, what a privilege it is to be able to uplift our veterans and their families to you this morning. What a debt that was given and paid. Lord, comforts left, sacrifices made. So that, Lord, today we could worship. Today, we can talk boldly about you. Lord, we have this freedom. Lord, that was bought with a price. Lord, not only as a country, but as believers in you. And Lord, as we take just a moment, Lord, to uplift our veterans to you. Lord, I pray for comfort for healing. There are so many that we have no idea what they go through on a daily basis. But allow us to be challenged when we're out to stop when we see a hat that says I'm a veteran or when we see our military personnel in their military gear. Lord, allow us to stop and say thank you. Lord, buy them something to drink, buy a meal for them. Lord, allow us to go above and beyond so that we can really express Lord, the gratitude that we feel and the freedom that we have. Lord, allow us not to take that for granted. But I pray that you just allow us this morning 
Lord, to enjoy the freedom, Lord, not only that our service men and women have provided for us, but also that you have provided for us, Lord, as your children. Lord, allow us to stop and to look towards you. Lord, allow us to continually look vertical so that our horizontal sight can be clear. Lord, thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, church, I want to call your attention to the second verse of this next song we're going to sing. You know, Christ fully exemplified that leaving comfort to seek and save. And we're going to sing about that in the second verse. It says, all praise to him whose love is seen in Christ the Son, the servant king, who left behind his glorious throne to pay the ransom for his own. Let's stand and sing this, this hymn, modern worship hymn together. sitting over there reminiscing a little bit. I'm sorry I have to start like this, but I was thinking some 45 years ago I stood here and read some scripture as a youth. And uh, some of you have been around a while may remember that great big huge white pulpit that used to be here. And just thinking about that and the changes that have taken place in this beautiful sanctuary, but also the fact that I now have bifocals. So <laughs> age comes quickly. Join me in reading from the 12th chapter of Hebrews verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endeared from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary of and or faint-hearted. God bless the reading of his word. participation and your prayers. Uh, we had a lot of volunteers that worked really hard. Um, we were able to live stream every worship gathering during revival services and we heard some wonderful preaching and was led in some uh, Christ honoring worship. And so it is, uh, it is good to uh, follow what a wonderful re week of revival services. 
uh, we have had. And I'm glad that you're here. Um, I know in revivals in the past, revival services at previous churches, um, I used to call it, I, to, I would tell Mandy, I said, you know, I'm expecting the revival hangover. Uh, in other words, everybody's just kind of tired and they get all pumped up and excited for revival and then revival services and then the week after it's like, we tam- we didn't do that this morning. You guys look excited and happy and ready to hear from God's word and we've already worshiped Jesus. We're going to continue in that. Um, two things that I want you to realize, I am not Daniel, all right? I'm Dwayne um, and that's the way God, cre- God created me and I'm pretty happy with that. And so if you send me, you see me bend over the way Daniel bent over, you just know that you're going to have to take me to the hospital for a knee replacement. (laughs) I'm not doing it. Uh, The other thing that I noticed is that when I put on my headset this morning is not only is Daniel much more thinner than I am, he also has a smaller head than I have. So you're going to see me adjusting a lot this morning, but that's all right. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans chapter 3. I think it's important for us to realize where where we're going it's always helpful to realize where we have been and so we're just going to quickly remember all of this if you're if you're studying the book of Romans you need to realize that it really builds the book of Romans builds on top and so Paul will make statements like we're going to see this morning and then he'll take a whole chapter chapter six and seven to really explain and go into deeper terminology and deeper words and explanation of what he's talking about. But what we've seen or what we will see this morning in Romans chapter 3 verses 21, uh, 27 through 31, we have to realize is based on what Paul has already explained in Romans chapter 3 verses 21 through 26. There Paul gave a very powerful explanation of how a person is saved. In verse 22, Paul makes the emphasis that the righteousness of God only happens through faith in Jesus Christ. The person who receives Jesus by faith is justified, declared righteous by God's grace, and redeemed by Christ's sacrifice. Furthermore, Christ's sacrifice received by faith appeases the wrath of God against sin. That's that theological word that we talked about a few weeks ago, propitiation. It is God's wrath against sin being appeased because of Christ's sacrifice upon the cross. Praise God for sweet salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. Amen? That was not very convincing. Amen. We should praise God for our salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, like a good preacher, Paul is going to go from explanation to implications. So what difference does it make that salvation is by faith in Christ Jesus? And Paul's going to explain that our salvation is, through Christ, will impact our heart, but not only does it impact our hearts, it impacts all of our relationships. So from God's word this morning, we will learn that salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, has personal and profound implications for the believer. Stand with me this morning in the reading of God's word. From Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 27. Paul says, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Pray with me. Father in heaven, We are grateful people to be in your presence. 
to hear your word preached and sung and prayed and read, gathering with brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is an honor. Father, as we continue in worship through your preached word, I pray, God, that you will give me the words to say. God, that you will hide me behind your cross. Lord, that you will speak directly to the hearts of your people and even those maybe who are not believers in here or watching. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this morning, I want to share with you from God's Word, from these verses, these five verses in Romans chapter 3, verses 27 through 31. I want to speak to you of three implications of the profound truth that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And this is the first implication that we see Paul explain. Number one, boasting is excluded because of faith's role in our salvation. Boasting is excluded because of faith's role in our salvation. Paul said there in verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Since God justifies, we talked about that in verses 21 through 26. What we mean by when we use that word justifies, God has made righteous all those who have faith in Jesus. Paul's going to ask a question. What then is boasting? What is boasting? And so in doing so and asking these questions, Paul reopens this dialogue with an imaginary opponent. We, we saw this at the end of chapter 2, but specifically we saw it a lot at the beginning of chapter 3. This imaginary opponent that Paul is kind of conversing with, answering questions of, who is struggling with the idea that humans contribute nothing to their own salvation. And so Paul sets up this imaginary diatribe, if you will, or dialogue with this imaginary opponent. Remember, he started this dialogue in uh, really with four articulated, clearly articulated questions beginning in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And Paul seems to be speaking here not only of wrongful boasting in the sense that look at my works, look at what I have done and how they saved me, but probably as justifiable pride on the part of the Jewish nation for being chosen by God for a special role in the redemption story. Remember Romans chapter 3 verse 2. Go a few verses ahead of where we are this morning. Romans chapter 3 verse 2. Paul said, much in every way to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So Paul has already established the fact of the special relationship that God's people, the Jewish people, have with God himself. And so there could be this sense of justifiable pride on behalf of the Jewish nation because God had chosen them to be his special people and they had a special role. They were, they were responsible for the oracles of God. So what kind of boastful pride is Paul speaking of here? Is he, is he speaking of this pride that takes place as we look at look at what we have done or or the Jewish sense of pride and honestly the answer to that is both or either it, it could be either way faith by its very nature rules out all boasting did you notice that language there that Paul gives in in verse 20 said what becomes of our boasting it is excluded that that means all boasting is excluded and if you look at this from uh, from a, a word study point of view, the New Testament word here for excluded is in the passive voice. It's not in the active voice, it's in the passive voice, which means it is God who excluded the basis for boasting and it's past tense, it's aorist, which is past tense, which means that he has done that, he did this decisively in the past. There is, there is no room for boasting. Now, Think of, think of it from this perspective. 
Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, based on Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone, should humble us. It should humble us. As, as we look and as we see what the Lord has done in our salvation, it, it should not well with inside of us uh, pride and boasting in ourselves, but instead it ought to be the, the other reaction, the opposite reaction. It ought to instill with inside of us a humility. You didn't earn your salvation. You didn't work for it. You can't make yourself righteous. It is a work of Almighty God. Is there an example of this in Scripture that we see? Absolutely. Take your Bible. Go with me to Luke chapter 18. You're going to have to turn. This one, this one is not on the screen in front of you. But I want you to turn to Luke chapter 18 because we see this mindset, this boasting in other places in Scripture. Luke chapter 18. Hold your place in Romans, by the way, because we'll come back. But in Luke chapter 18... Beginning in verse 9, Jesus is going to tell a parable. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. He re the Bible reads, He also told them this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So it's almost as if Jesus is anticipating what Paul's going to talk about in Romans chapter 3 and the importance of salvation being through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And he's going to give a story or a parable to show uh, the opposite of the people who are relying on their own righteousness or at least one example. In verse 10, two men went up in the temple to pray, once a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. You can, al you can almost picture this story, right? God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortion. You can almost hear this religious leader pointing at this tax collector that would have been despised and would have been hated among the people. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this man or other men like him, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. I'm not a sinner like this man or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. He's going to begin to talk about all the good religious things that he does. I tax or I give tithes of all that I get. I fast twice a week. Verse 13, but the tax collector, so the scene changes. Remember, the religious leaders already pointed this tax collector out, right? I'm not like this guy. But the tax collector, strong contrast, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. End of the story. And Jesus gives a little bit of an explanation to this parable. I tell you, this man, which man is he speaking of? The man right over here, the tax collector, this man went down to his house justified rather than the religious leader, the Pharisee, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We see this kind of imagery that Paul's speaking about and Jesus gives a personal illustration of or a parable of. We see it in Scripture. We see it in modern day life. There's examples of this all over the place. How do you know if someone is like this tax collector and they have been gripped by the gospel? Or better yet, how do you know if someone has, if the gospel has gripped the heart of someone? How do you know? This is important, church. Don't miss this. The person that has been gripped by the grace of Almighty God, the gospel rules and reigns in their heart, will give praise to God. The, the praise will not, the boast will not be in self. The boast will not be in look at all the things that I have done. The boast will be look at what Jesus has done. 
Look at what Jesus has done in my life. The praise will be to God, and that person will be humbly grateful. That's not just a thing for Thanksgiving, okay? That's a, that's a thing for believers every day. They recognize that they have received salvation through the law of faith or the principle of faith, not through works done in obedience to the law. Here it is, church. In heaven, no one, no one will say in heaven, look at what I've accomplished by my piety and my devotional life, my spiritual depth, or my deep studies of the scripture. No, boast is excluded when I think of our pride and how we contribute to our salvation I'm reminded of uh, the, the story of Stacy King who played for the Chicago Bulls uh, kind of the peak of Michael Jordan's uh, you know tenure there with the Chicago Bulls one night Michael Jordan scored 69 points and Stacy King scored one point when they were interviewing King later after the game, he said, I'll always remember this night as the night that MJ and I scored 70 points. <clears throat> of course, King was joking, but in our pride, we're serious when we take credit for our own salvation. Listen, friend, here's the fact of the matter. Unlike Stacy King, you did not contribute one point to your salvation. You didn't even contribute one point. If we did contribute anything to our salvation besides the sin that placed us in the position that we're in in the first place, if we contributed anything to our salvation, you better believe that we would boast about it for all of eternity. But since we didn't, guess what? There's only one acceptable boasting in this situation and that is us boasting in Jesus for all of eternity we boast in him now there's some implications here that we see in the text the first one we just studied boasting is excluded because of faith faith's role in our salvation but number two there's a second implication since we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, boasting is excluded because of the universal scope of our salvation. Look at verse 28 and following. Got to go back to Romans though. Romans chapter 3 verse 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. What's Paul doing here? In verse 28, Paul is going to state his basic premise in a summarizing way. He says, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So this is, this is the basic truth that the Apostle Paul has been driving home to these listeners. People are made right with God through faith and not by obedience to the law. So some of you may be thinking what I thought this week. But doesn't that contradict passages in the Bible like James chapter 2 verses 14 through 26 that speak to the vital importance of faith and good works? Some people think there's a contradiction here. What's going on? Are, are Paul and James at odds with one another? Absolutely not. There's no contradiction in Scripture. First, it's important to realize that both James and the Apostle Paul affirm that we are saved by grace through faith alone. Both of, the, both of them affirm that fact. But it's also important to realize that each man was addressing a different problem. James in chapter 2 and really throughout the book of James was looking at those who professed to have faith in Christ but their lives were devoid of works. James claims that that sort of faith was not genuine and it does not save anyone. Genuine saving faith in Jesus always results in a life of good works. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. But Paul in Romans that we're studying, but also in the book of Galatians, was writing to those who taught that we must add our works to faith in Christ in order to be justified. 
Paul's not saying here in Romans chapter 3, nor is he saying in the book of Galatians, that our good works aren't important. That's not what Paul's saying. But here's the truth. We are saved to do good works. We're not saved because of our good works. Now Paul's going to show that this basic truth has a universal scope. Look at verse 29. Paul says, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised. What does he mean when Paul, he's already used this terminology already in the book of Romans. When he speaks of the circumcised, he's speaking of the Jews. When he speaks of the uncircumcised, he's speaking of the Gentiles. So he says here, who will justify the circumcised? Who will justify the Jew by faith? And who will justify the circumcised or the Gentile through faith? And so Paul's point here is this. Salvation is for everyone who believes. Salvation is for the Jew who believes. Salvation is for the Gentile who believes. And since God is one, There aren't two ways, two different ways of being saved. There's not one way for the Jew and one way for the Gentile. There's one way. There's one God, one baptism, one salvation. And wisely, Paul's going to appeal to the fundamental truth of Judaism. Going all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and the Shema. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. This would have resonated with his Jewish audience who knew the Shema well. And since the Lord is God and the Lord is one, the same faith that saves the Jew is the same faith that saves the Gentile. Since God is one and Lord of all, there can, there can only be one way of justification. And that one way is through the vehicle of faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul's going to speak about this to his young protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. I think we have that scripture. Paul says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires, listen to this, all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So Paul, this is something that we see consistent through Paul's ministry. Paul was Paul was the evangelist to the Gentiles, but he's speaking here to Jews and Gentiles. And when Paul speaks about the universal scope of the gospel, there are at least two major implications that we have to stop and consider. You ready? Number one, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all. All who believe. The gospel is for all who believe. And since the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all who believe, guess what? Campbellsville Baptist Church packs and prays over shoeboxes because we want children and families all over the world all over the world to hear the gospel and to receive Jesus by faith. That's why you see all these boxes that we were able by God's grace to pack and have fun packing yesterday. And since the gospel is for all, guess what? It doesn't stop there. Campbellsville Baptist Church gives through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering so that we can support over 3,500 missionaries who are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. But it doesn't stop there. Since the gospel is for all, Campbellsville Baptist Church supports New churches, new church starts or church plants in Cincinnati, Grace Church and Bridge City Church. If you haven't been following those churches on social media, man, let me encourage you to do so. Man, God is at work. He is using Grace Church. God is using Bridge City Church. People are getting saved. Their attendance is growing. It's awesome to see what the Lord's doing. By the way, we're looking at ways to bring those two church planter pastors in in 2023 to spend time with us so that we can encourage them and they can be an encouragement to us. But we do that because the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all people. 
all peoples. We take the gospel to Cincinnati. And since the gospel's for all, Campbellsville Baptist Church takes the gospel to people right here in Taylor County, right here in Campbellsville through various ministries and missions such as Room at the Inn. You're gonna hear a little bit more about that even next Sunday. And why do we do all this? Why, are we just participating in activities just to kill time? Why do we do what we do? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only for you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for all who will receive it by faith. It is a gift meant to be shared to all the world. And so we see that's an implication of the text. The gospel of Jesus is for all people. Number two, this is important, a second implication. If, if Jews and Gentiles alike are saved the same way, there's not a Gentile way to be saved and a Jewish way to be saved. All are saved as they respond by faith to King Jesus. Since Jews and Gentiles alike are saved by the same way before the same God and are therefore, guess what? Unified in the gospel, then the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. The idea is this. The gospel of Jesus Christ not only changes our vertical relationship with God, certainly it does. Through the gospel, we can be reconciled back to holy God despite our sin, by his grace, through faith alone. It also, the implication here is this, the gospel must also change our horizontal relationships with others. This is why, for many reasons, but probably the greatest, racism is so out of step with the gospel. The gospel destroys the barrier between us and God. And guess what? The gospel destroys the barrier between ethnicities. One pastor said it this way, God's grace enables us to be gracious instead of racist. Some of you have studied the Civil War, maybe read books on the Civil War. You well know that the American Civil War divided our nation as well as families. But it also divided the church in America. Two months after the war ended, members of the St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia gathered for worship. And at the end of the sermon... The pastor invited the worshipers to approach the altar to receive communion. And to the great shock of everyone that was in attendance in the congregation, the first man to walk down that aisle to receive communion was a black man. Outraged, none of the other worshipers left their seats to take communion. And after a few moments from the back, a dignified white man was seen walking down the aisle to take communion. He knelt beside the black man to actually receive communion. That man's name was General Robert E. Lee. And after General Lee came down, guess what? The other members of the church moved forward for communion. General Lee came to believe that there is neither free nor slave for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And if the ground is level, and it is at the foot of the cross, that should not only affect our relationships with other ethnicities, you better believe it ought to impact our relationships with people in the church. I read a Barna statistic this week that just broke my heart. It said that one out of every four practicing Christians struggle to forgive someone. You, let me say that again. The Barna statistic shared, and this is the people that were honest, okay, that one out of every four, not lost people, okay, one out of every four practicing Christians struggles with unforgiveness. Do the, do the math this morning if we have about 300 people here, then that means there's at least 75 people in, the, in this congregation this morning that are struggling with forgiveness. 
That's not okay, church. So if that's true, and we have 300 people today, and it's 75 are harboring unforgiveness in their hearts, does the Bible have anything to say about our relationship with others? Colossians 3, 12 through 15. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Let me just stop there. I think it's significant to, to see in this passage of Scripture that Paul twice there in Colossians used the phrase one another. Did you see that? Or did you hear that? Paul, Paul's not speaking here of us being willing to forgive people outside of the church. That, that's a given. Paul's speaking about those who are harboring unforgiveness with a brother or a sister in Christ inside the church. Are you with me? Now listen, we can talk and we can pray and we can wax eloquent about revival taking place in our hearts and lives. But a, very, a key ingredient for revival taking place in any of our hearts and revival taking place in our churches is that we would forgive those who have done wrong against us. It's got to begin there. If we're harboring unforgiveness Maybe, maybe the person's no longer even in the church. Maybe they are in the church. But it better begin in our hearts with offering forgiveness to one another. Paul goes on to say there in Colossians 3, just as the Lord has forgiven you. Did you, did you hear the standard of forgiveness? Think about what the Lord has forgiven in your heart, in your life. All the sin that you and I have committed. Mount, Mount Everest of sin against the Lord. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, you also ought to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is a perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ to which you were also called in one body rule your hearts. And I love what he says there, and be thankful. By the way, be thankful. Be thankful for what the Lord has done in your heart and life, and be willing to to love one another and put differences aside. Now, Pastor, why are you making such a big deal out of this? Because this, if we've been, we've been reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ, this is right. This will always impact this. This will all, the relation, your relationship with Jesus will always impact your horizontal relationships. And here's the deal. If this isn't right, hear me church. If this isn't right, if your horizontal relationships are not right, something's not right here. And we just continue and we continue and we say, you know what? It'll be okay. That's on them. If this is right, you're going to seek for this to be right with brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want you to hear me. Hear me. If this isn't right, something's wrong here. Something's not right in your vertical relationship with the Lord. Because the vertical relationship with Jesus always affects the horizontal relationships with others. Since we are saved by grace alone through faith alone... In Christ Jesus alone, boasting is excluded because of the universal scope of our salvation. Now let's look at the third and final implication. Since we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, boasting is excluded because of the law's role in our salvation. Look at verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Paul is answering the, the possible question that maybe some of his listeners would have. If the law doesn't make us righteous, then what good is the law? Shouldn't we just overthrow the law? The word means 
The New Testament word here, here means to nullify the law or render the law ineffectual. Should we just not cast the law? What, what difference does the law make? And Paul's going to quickly answer that question, not for a moment. We don't do away or annul the law. May it never be. In other words, the law should not be dismissed entirely. The law remains useful. It's good for moral instruction. It details God's provident, provident promises and God's purposes in the world. I found a quote this morning from Spurgeon in regards to this. Spurgeon wrote that the law is also very useful because, listen to this, the law shows us our defections and our stains. It's like the looking glass. He's talking about a mirror. Which my lady, I love that language, holds up to her face that she may see if there be any spot in it. James talks about that in James chapter 1 verses 23 and following. But she cannot wash her face with a looking glass. When the mirror has done its utmost, then there are the same stains. The mirror of God's word, the law, just reveals to us all of our imperfections, right? It just reveals to us that we fall short of the glory of God. It cannot take away a single spot. It can only share or show where those spots are. And the law, though it reveals our sins, our shortcomings, and our transgressions, it cannot remove the sin or the transgression. It is weak for that purpose because it was never intended to accomplish such an end. You know what the, the law, and, we're, and Paul's going to talk about this in Romans chapter 6 and 7, so we're going to get there eventually. But what the law ultimately does is it reveals to our hearts. If we look at it honestly, if we look at the law intently, we recognize that we fall short and we need help. And it drives us to Jesus. It drives us. The law reveals to our hearts that we cannot, only Jesus can, and that we, we must be dependent upon Jesus and Jesus alone. So we see here, Paul, who's going to say, may it never be, not for a moment. Don't dismiss the law. The law was given to show mankind the perfect standard of God's righteousness and to show us that those standards are impossible to meet in our own power. The law points us to the need for faith in our Savior. The law should never be considered a means to a right relationship with God in and of itself. So therefore, Paul concludes there in verse 31, on the contrary, we uphold the law. What does that mean? He's going to talk about this later in Romans chapter 7. Paul's going to teach Romans 7, 12, that the law is good. The law is holy. The law identifies sin and tells us that we're under the power of sin but the law in and of itself is incapable of helping us to overcome that sin. Only through Jesus. By faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ Jesus alone can we overcome sin. So what have we learned this morning from God's word? Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone has personal and profound implications upon the believer. Justification by faith excludes all boasting except for boasting in Christ and him crucified. It, it doesn't allow me to say, I teamed up with Jesus and we scored 70 points. That's not how it works. No, Jesus scored all the points. God justifies sinners totally on the merits of Jesus when they abandon their own works and trust in him alone. Folks, that is the true gospel. So how do we respond? Let me conclude this morning with three simple but profound ways to respond to this message. Number one, believe and stand firm upon this gospel. Believe it. Stand firm upon it. Even when, and there are many, even when other religions and cults say otherwise, 
that you must do this and this and this to be saved, whatever they may say that they add to Jesus, we stand firm upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't flinch. We stand firm upon the word. Believe and stand firm upon the gospel. Number two, rejoice in this gospel. Rejoice in this gospel. We, we don't boast in our own works, right? We've established that fact. Boasting is excluded. But we do boast in our Savior. Amen? Oh my goodness. I know yesterday was a rough day for some of us football-wise, but listen, folks, if we can't boast, if we don't boast in our Savior, what, what difference does any other boasting make, eternally speaking? <laughs> We're talking about for eternity. We boast in our Savior and what He has done. Listen, you should not have to tell a saved person to be joyful. <laughs> Some of us need to tell our faces what Jesus has done. Listen, joy ought to be the natural default of the believer. That's our default position as followers of Christ. That doesn't mean I'm talking about joy despite what's going on. I'm not always happy about my circumstances, but I can have joy and peace despite what may be going on around me. Shouldn't have to tell a saved person to be joyful. Rejoice in this gospel. And then thirdly, this should go without saying, we ought to be willing to proclaim this gospel to others. And we do that through shoeboxes, and we do that through, you know, giving through Lottie Moon. But you know what? If, if we're willing to go across the world or ship boxes across the world, and praise God that many of you have participated, and this has been an awesome endeavor, and it always is every year, we sure better be willing to go across the street and tell people about what Jesus has done in our hearts and lives. Amen? Stand with me, please. Our musicians are going to come. This is, this is an opportunity for us to respond to the Lord Jesus this morning publicly. Maybe some of you would say, you know what, Pastor, I've been relying on works. And I've come to realize through this study of Romans that I and no one else can be saved by works. We are only saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone not by works. Should our works be evident? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should our joy be evident? Absolutely. But we're not saved because of them. We're saved because of Jesus. But we're certainly saved to do them. We're saved to do good works. So maybe this morning you say, Pastor, Honestly, there's never been a time in my life where I have trusted Jesus alone for salvation. In just a moment, we're going to pray. And after we pray, we're going to sing. But maybe the Lord's dealing with your heart. and You just want to speak to one of our pastors, one of our prayer partners. We invite you to come. Maybe you'd say this morning, Pastor, I know Jesus. I've, I've trusted him. I'm thankful for my salvation. Maybe this morning you just want to come and pray for someone else that you know needs the same Jesus that you have. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for how clear your word is. Thank you for Paul submitting himself, recognizing that there's not multiple versions of the gospel. There is one gospel and there's only one one way by which man must be saved, and that is through, by grace, through faith in Jesus. And Father, for any person in this room or that may be watching online that's been playing games for years and have never recognized their need for a Savior, the only way to be saved through Jesus, God, would you stir their hearts right now. Father, for believers in this room who say that the vertical relationship with you is good,
but horizontal relationships and their life is a mess, I pray, God, right now you would bring them under conviction by your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that they would desire to make that relationship right as far as it depends upon them. So, Lord, may your Spirit move and touch hearts and lives in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we're going to sing together. We invite you as the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning to respond to Jesus by faith. Amen. We're going to sing a great hymn of our faith this morning together, church, talking about trusting here vertically and then obeying here horizontally. Thankful for our, our pastor and his word this morning. with the Lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way let us do his good will he abides in us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and Pray with me, Lord Jesus. We uh, thank you for stirring hearts and lives. And uh, God, thank you for how your spirit moves. Lord, that you may still be stirring hearts in this place. God, we know that you're at work. Father, we pray no matter what you are calling us to do, no matter what you're placing on our hearts, Lord, I pray that we will step out in obedience and faith to you, Jesus. And we pray this in the name above all names and all God's people said, amen. Hey, God is good all the time. Amen. Hey, be seated just for a moment. I'm going to ask uh, the Flanagans first. Y'all come and, and stand with me. This is uh, Dan and Jenny Flanagan. I think most of y'all know the Flanagans. Uh, Brother Dan was the uh, director, the BCM director at uh, Campbellsville University for a season. Uh, it's pretty cool not only to have one 
BCM director or former BCM. We have two. How about that? Um, yeah. I didn't realize until maybe about a month ago the Flanagans uh, came up to me. and Well, they said, they, hey, Pastor, we'd love to talk to you. And I said, sure. And uh, they, they shared with me. They said, you know, we don't know if you know this or not, but our, our membership used to be at Campbellsville Baptist uh, years ago. And then the Lord gave them the opportunity to serve at a, at a sister church, uh, Nolan, uh, Nolan Baptist. And, uh, and that's where their membership has been because they were serving that church faithfully. And so they said it's time for them to uh, make it official and join back here at Campbellsville Baptist. So if you're like me and you rejoice in that, let's thank the Lord and just give uh, the Lord a hand. Amen. Amen. Um, you're going to, in just a little bit, um, you're going to want to come by and just uh, love on the Flanagans and just allow that, let them know how much you appreciate them and how thankful we are that they're officially back a part of our faith family here at Campbellsville Baptist. I'm going to ask the Ramoses, y'all come and stand with me, with me as well. Um, this is Justin and Savannah. I think most of you know them as well. They're great servants at our church. Savannah has been our interim uh, preschool director and is just, has done a wonderful job. And a lot of that, as y'all well know, is behind the scenes. Uh, but y'all know how important that is. Uh, both of them teach and work with Campbellsville Independent Schools, and they, they have a great uh, ministry that the Lord is allowing them to use there. But they come forward this morning like the Flanagans. Uh, they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they would also like to move their membership here to Campbellsville Baptist Church. And so if you rejoice in that, let's thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. Both of these couples have faithfully been coming to Campbellsville Baptist. They're, they're just kind of making it public this morning, kind of making it official. And so we rejoice in that. You know, the Lord may be calling some of you to do that as well. And if you want to talk about that, some of our pastors will be available right after uh, this worship service. All right. Y'all can be seated. And I think Ed has some closing words and then we'll be dismissed. It's been a good day to be in the house of the Lord. <laughs> I would second what the preacher said earlier about uh, joy and enthusiasm. So, uh, speaking of enthusiasm, next week we have our Thanksgiving dinner, and you want to see enthusiasm, you watch a church full of Baptists go at a food line. <laughs> that is enthusiasm. And uh, there will probably be more than one line, so you get to see who, which line is in the most enthusiastic. But uh, in, your, uh, uh, in your bulletin and uh, on the screen, you can see uh, information about the church Thanksgiving meal. That is next Sunday. That is a tremendous time of fellowship. And we want to make sure everyone knows that they are invited and welcome. And you notice that it says, uh, <laughs> uh, there's no child care, but please read the next line. If, if you see no child care, it's because we want the kids in there eating with us. Don't come as a mom and dad and think you're going to squirrel your kids off in the nursery. <laughs> and you're going to eat all the food and, and have a take-home-a-sack kind of thing with, uh, for the kids. But everyone's invited. It's a family dinner. And so uh, bring the kids. The church is providing them meat, bread, and drinks. And you notice there, uh, if your last name begins with A through L, please bring a vegetable and a salad. That's more than one vegetable, like not just an ear of corn. And so, uh, and then M through Z, please bring a vegetable and dessert. Again, more than one vegetable. So, uh, or more than one of that vegetable. But let's have a good time on, on, uh, at our Thanksgiving dinner. Enjoy that fellowship around the table. That's like no other time. This morning you've been here, and uh, you know at the end of the services, we'll have people at the doors who'll be uh, there to collect your offering. And uh, in addition to handing it off at the doors, you can do that online through the website, all those different ways that you can do that. There you go. You can see the graphic there on the screen. So uh, thank you for your financial support. Thank you for your support uh, in worship and Sunday school and for fellowship opportunities like uh, the Thanksgiving meal. But I also want to uh, thank you for your support of things like Operation Christmas Child. And Amy Anderson is right here. Uh, to share a little bit more about OCC, and she's going to close us in prayer as well. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Ed is a hard act to follow, but I will try. Um, 
I just want to thank you all and give praise to God for what you see amongst us today because there are, we know, at least 2,300 boxes in this sanctuary. So each of you probably has 16 children sitting in the pew with you. I would have a little PTSD about that, but 16 children is what those boxes are. There's 16 children in the pew with you who are going to receive a gift and the opportunity to hear the gospel message around this world. You've got a choir like 400 up here, um, but uh, there's a, they're a life. And so I just want to encourage you um, to pray for those um, lives that are next to you as we close in prayer today, but also to remember like the pastor preached today and like we've heard in revival this week, um, there are probably 16 people sitting next to you somewhere this week too that need to hear the gospel message or that you come into contact with. And so I thank you for your support of Operation Christmas Child and the ministry that it is. We're coming back at one o'clock. If you would like to come back and help us get those into the large cartons, uh, we would appreciate some help with that this afternoon. If you have not brought your box and would like to distribute it uh, this week to the distribution center that CU runs, it's out on Old Hodgenville Road. Um, in the old furniture building that I have reached an age where I cannot remember the name of that business uh, from back in the day. But uh, so you still have the opportunity to fill a box this week and get it to the distribution center that CU runs. Thank you all for your attendance today and join me in prayer as we pray for these children and for the lives they represent. Dear Lord, we thank you for each box here today and for the life and the family that it represents. And we know from what we've heard that each box will reach six to seven people, Lord, because of the family impact that it has. And we just pray for each of these children and their families and all of those who these boxes will reach. And we pray for those who are delivering those boxes and teaching these children and giving them the gospel message. And we just pray, Lord, that they will come to know you and that the things that seem so simple to us will have a lasting impact on their lives to let them know that they are loved and that they are created by a God who loves them and that they have been um, saved by Christ and we just ask that you will um, put on our hearts also those who are around us this week as we go forward and apply the things that um, we have come to learn and that we will have the opportunity to boast about our Jesus Lord in Christ's name we pray amen